All right, welcome, ladies and gents. We have a special guest here who I'm very excited to introduce. His name is Brent Weaver, and he was the founder of a web design agency, which he actually sold in 2012. And ever since, he has been spending his time helping other agency owners and freelancers scale at You Gurus, which is basically an agency growth program he started almost 10 years ago. Um, congrats on your success so far. It's, it, it, it's very excited to have you here. Yeah, Taylor, great to be here. Thanks for the compliments. I, I love it. Um, first, let's just dive into your background and your backstory. You know, when did you actually start this web design agency? And let's kind of walk everybody through that story. In lunch detention in uh, my last <laughs> year of high school. Uh, it wasn't actually, I was not in detention. My business partner at the time was in lunch detention. And okay. I happened to be walking through. At least that's the story I'm sticking to. Uh, is that I was not in detention. I was just, I was walking through and, and he, uh, I was building some websites at the time and he was doing, I don't know what he was doing, like selling email lists or this is 1999. Like, I don't know, he made some money in the internet and I went up to him and said, Hey dude, I heard, heard you made some money in the internet. And he came over after school and then we we're like, let's create a company <laughs> together. I don't even think we knew what we were doing. We just wanted to create a company together. And you know, that's how it started. Wow, he came home after school detention. Those words are bringing me back. Yeah, that so that was 1999. Wow, legendary. That is, uh, I can't. Even, I don't even know what that time was like. Dude, I was, I was just born. When yeah. um, when did it kind of get serious? What was the beginnings like? Like when you guys started to quickly take off? Uh, how was the first couple years like for you guys? So so we went. Um, you know, we kind of did the. I think entrepreneurship now is is maybe more accepted kind of post.com. And I think a lot of millennials like are like we see entrepreneurship as I'm kind of like that last year, earliest year of millennials. But I think a lot of young people now are seeing entrepreneurship as a more accessible thing. I, we were the only two kids that we knew in our entire high school that had created a business. And so we still kind of did the thing that we thought we were supposed to, which is go to college yeah. And we kept the business going on the side. I was up at CU Boulder. He was at UT Austin. And in wow. the summer, I'd come back to Dallas and we would get an office together and we would, you know, try to make some money over the summer. I think we drank most of our income in Red Bull. And um, <laughs> it, it, was, it was not a really profitable enterprise, but we did find some strategic partners. We got some rev share and some e-commerce uh, businesses um, we got involved with some really sketchy people that wanted to, you know, take advantage of some young, you know, web designers and pay them nothing and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it was, it was like a few years of the wild west. And I think in 2003, we got a legitimate opportunity for a, a six figure project. And we flew out to California, did wow. a big pitch, totally bombed it, but it still like woke us up to, yeah. Hey, maybe we could go do this full time and make a, you know, instead of going in and getting jobs. Right. Mm -hmm. And then did you guys transition to full time that year, 2003, 2004? Um, it was, yeah. So basically we started making that transition, mm -hmm. kind of stopped going to school uh, yeah. in our last semester. And then just uh, he moved out to Boulder and we started working on the business full time. And wow. um, it was, uh, it was a little bit scary at first. We were just in my, you know, my condo or whatever. And just working at this uh, eight foot wide, like office depot table with our big 21 inch monitors and, you know, like living on hot dogs, macaroni and cheese in forties. And, um, and then by 2015, we opened an office in downtown Denver and started hiring people and, and things started going our way a little bit. We made some pretty big mistakes, but we started to grow and that was cool. Wow. Amazing. And then you guys ended up fast forward, just kind of run through this. You guys ended up selling out in 2012, was it? That's right. So we had about 14 uh, full-time team members plus uh -huh. a crew of contractors. Our business was kind of split between the agency work. And then we had also launched some info products yeah. and some, uh, some, some template stuff for Adobe. Yeah. And um, we decided in 2012 to kind of lean into the, the training business, the coaching business and the, the template business and stuff that we were doing with Adobe at the time. Right. And we decided to basically spin off the agency and sell that asset to another agency in town. And so we had about 300 clients in our active management and we, we sold that business in 2012. Legendary. And I think you told me on a previous call, call you guys were doing around seven figures revenue annually speaking um, prior to selling in that range. Yeah. 
Yeah. So our, our revenue was probably somewhere around 93 to 105 K a month on average. Yeah. Um, and so it was, it was a pretty good business. I actually loved the agency and I also loved our training business and it was a really difficult decision, but we kind of looked at it and said, Hey, wow. we really have two different businesses here. Like one of them is serving, you know, agency owners, web professionals, it's very product driven. Um, and then the other one is, you know, these longer sales cycles, these, you know, 30, 50, hundred K projects where we're, right. you know, it's just a totally different animal. And so we kind of found out one day we had like, there was like two different parts of our company and it was really hard to like create a cohesive vision. I mean, I had seen some companies do that where they had like, you know, they had their fingers in a lot of different pies. And I think I just have a hard time with that idea. I kind of equate it to like riding two horses at the same time. Like there are some people that can do that. They're just really talented. And I'm just not one of them. And so I have to have like the one horse mindset. I appreciate the one horse. I, uh, yeah, it's very difficult to, to have two. And I would say it's very difficult. Really cool. I, I love that. that. That's amazing. And uh, it's cool to know that also it was a hard decision for you. It wasn't just like this easy thing. Like, you know, if it was hard, it was clear that you actually enjoyed the agency, um, which means you guys probably had something that was really, you know, neat and, and, and nice to actually work on. Um, I'm curious to know, transitioning into you gurus, uh, tell everyone a bit about that and, and kind of why you started it, why you felt compelled to start it. Um, and how that's been over the last 10 years. Yeah, I was actually on my honeymoon in uh, the summer of 2012. I got married. It was the first vacation that I had taken. And I think, t- and I think t- 10 years, right. I took, uh, I took, we took two weeks off and um, my wife and I went to uh, St. Lucia and somewhere around the 10th day of like being completely unplugged. I like had kind of a, a, I don't know, somewhere between like a panic attack and a breakthrough of like, <laughs> I need to reconcile something and I need to simplify and lean into this new thing. And, um, you know, it's time we had gotten, uh, we had been doing a little bit of the training stuff. We had a little bit of traction there. Okay. And I'd been getting these, um, I call them these like thank you letters of people that had, you know, our sales training or our marketing training had impacted. And I got this one like six page letter from this guy, you know, he, told me his whole life story. Like he had been through this like terrible divorce. His wife thought he was a deadbeat, you know, and he was this web designer and he just like couldn't make a living uh-huh. and he actually lost custody of his kid. And it was, it was a really dark time for him. He went through our sales training and he learned how to sell, you know, he was selling $2,000 websites. So he started selling these, you know, use my sales methodology, started selling 25, $30,000 projects uh-huh. and from basically making, you know, nothing like $30,000 a year to, you know, $200,000 a year business was able right. to hire a lawyer, start, you know, getting some shared custody back, started coaching his daughter's soccer team, started wow. to build that relationship back up and, you know, bought a house. And so, you know, I got this, you know, I started getting letters like that. Yeah. And, you know, we used to get like, thank you cards from clients. Like, Hey, thanks for building our website. But nobody ever sent me like a six page letter with like a picture of hey. him and their daughter, right. Uh, on the soccer field. And so I think we, you know, we were getting that kind of stuff. I had done the agency game for a long time. I always tell people it was like getting a unofficial MBA, right? Like I got to go into like the smallest conference rooms, kitchens, factories, you know, big corporate, you know, dish network, you know, the, the big corporate conference rooms and do big pitches. And I mean, and everything in between, right? Over like 12 or 13 years, you just don't realize how many different businesses and nonprofits and government organizations that we had to like, there was just so much variety. And it was like, I got to learn a ton about business. And then, you know, we tried a bunch of niches and eventually I just found like, I found that niche after enough iteration. And it was like, Hey, I really want to lean into this thing with web pros and with agency owners. And I think we can make a big impact there. So, so it was like, it feels like it was really clear in the rear view mirror, but I think when it was happening, yeah. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. Like when it's happening, it felt super messy. It felt like we were breaking a lot of stuff and uh, it was, it was challenging for sure. I, I, I came back from my honeymoon, sat down with my business partner and I was like, Hey, here's the deal. Like we're going to make some changes. And it was a, a six hour conversation and it was like, not pretty. Like yeah. we were like arguing and fighting and like, you know, eventually, you know, we, we reconciled that and, and decided to, to make some big changes. Perfect transition because my next question was on the topic of niches um, 
And I think a lot of people on the channel, I guess, already kind of have like at least a, a few clients making a few thousand dollars a month, if not five, 10K a month. But there's also a large portion that are seem to common, like a lot of comments are like, how do you pick a niche? How do you pick a niche? I've made videos on it, but I'm really curious to know for you, how, what is your strategy for like that niche selection process or finding that blue ocean that's not, you know, crazy competitive, but there's also a demand for like service. How do you, what's your strategy for that? Yeah. And, and you know, and you mentioned this idea of like blue ocean versus red ocean. And I think there's definitely something to that. I think that, you know, there are very few agencies that are that have significant market share in any, in any niche, I think because of the nature of agencies, right. It's very personal, like a very relationship driven. And so I think even markets that have a lot of activity going on, I mean, nobody has like, there's no Coca-Cola, you know, I mean, if you think about restaurants, right. I mean, is there any agency that has more than like, I don't know, I mean, is there any agency that has 1% market share of restaurants? Like probably not. Right. So even in those highly competitive markets, I think, there's still such a localized component and there's such a relationship yeah. component. It's, it's really hard to like be, you know, a major competitor uh, in that market. But I think what I look at is three areas. I mean, does the niche have money and do they spend it on your services? I mean, that's a really easy thing to figure out. Mm -hmm. There are some really awesome markets out there like legal that they have a lot of money, but they're also yeah. historically, I mean, they're very tight with their money. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that can be a problem, right? So they have to have money and they need to be willing to spend it. And you can usually look online and, and find that out pretty quick. Like, you know, are they putting money in their website? Are there, you know, 10 companies advertising on Google? You know, are there, are, if you go through those funnels, are they sophisticated in nature? You know, I mean, is, is there proof that like an agency or a department are, are running this kind of thing? So right. I like to look for some proof of money. Uh, the other thing is, do you have an interest there? I don't, advocate passion because I think passion comes later. But if you're not interested in the markets, right. then that's a problem. If you like, you know, we worked in one market where um, I live in Colorado and, you know, early adopter in, in the state was in terms of medical marijuana. Right. And I don't know, it was like a, this green rush, like this gold rush for, for, you know, the green revolution or whatever. And it just wasn't like an area that I personally was very interested in. I knew there was money being spent I think I went to go meet a potential client and they put me in this, uh, you know, I rang the doorbell or whatever, the buzzer, and I had to enter a cage uh, and I had, and they locked both doors and I'm in a cage and I'm like waiting for the meet, you know, I'm waiting for them to let me in the office. And I was in the cage for five minutes. I don't know. I had to like hand my license through like a little bin and I'm in a, you know, and so I'm like, okay, like, I'm sure there's money here. I'm sure people are going to come in and crush it. But like, for me, I'm like, there just wasn't that. It was, there wasn't that interest, right? That it was like, I'm, this is yeah. worth it for me. Yeah. Uh, so interest needs to be there. And then the last component that I look for is, is results. Can you get this, this market results? And I think if you look at those three things, regardless of how much competition there is in the market, if they have money, if you're interested in, in working with them and you can get them some kind of results, quantifiable, emotional, tangible results, yeah. like you're going to do well. If you can't get the results, or you hate the market or you're not, you know, there's no money there, then I think that it, it's difficult, right? So if we, if we meet those three criteria, I think that's enough of a strategy that we can start to execute on. And then from there, as you get experience in a market, you'll find some opportunities to kind of tack, right? To maybe refine. So love that. Love those three areas. I, I use the word curiosity. Like you got to have curiosity in it. I agree with the, kind of the passion thing. It's, I, I felt, I only became passionate after like years of doing what we do. But uh, for the third element, which is, can you get the results? A tricky element because for a true beginner, they may not have any expertise in one vertical where they feel like they're, they have the confidence to deliver results. For me, I went through a lot of imposter syndrome in the beginning because it was like the experience I had was with my dad's tiny little Amazon business that had like, you know, I had like $2,000 of advertising spend under my belt. And so I was like, can I really do this? And it was just that mindset thing. So how can someone feel like they can get the results when they're in that stage of they're not like a specialist in any vertical? Yeah. I mean, I think look, re results are relative to the investment that you're, 
your clients making. Mm-hmm. Um, there's an old, you know, an old agency saying of, uh, you don't get paid for this project, you get paid for your last project. So if you don't have any experience in a market and mm-hmm. you're a little bit green in terms of your ability to, to prove results, yeah. then you're probably going to have to try to get your foot in the door in some way, right? I mean, whether that's price, whether that's um, speed, whether that's the overall quality, or I mean, something you're going to have to do to differentiate yourself. Price is an easy one. Because yeah, one of the reasons that people don't hire an agency is risk. Like I'm going to pay you $10,000 and what am I going to get in return? If I don't know the answer to that, yeah. if, it, if it feels risky, then I'm going to have some hesitation around that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I look at some of the early projects that we did and look, I don't like, if you have experience in a market, like if somebody comes to me and says, and we get this all the time, somebody will message me and be like, Hey, Brad, if your if your program works so well, why don't I, you know, why don't you, you know, why don't I pay you 10% of all of the projects that I get from your system? Right, it's right, like, right. It's like, I don't, like, I have plenty of results I've gotten people. Like, I don't need to take that risk. I don't need to, like, invest in your business. Like, you need right. to invest in your own business. But if I was, you know, in those early days of our agency, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, we took we took some chances, right? I mean, we, we didn't get, you know, we had projects where we weren't getting paid super well. Maybe we were doing some spec work. Do I advocate people do spec work in general? No. But if you're trying to break into a market and you doing a little bit of free work is the difference between, you know, an Amazon reseller taking a chance with you, and that's going to speed up your ability to get an early adopter by three or six months, then, you know, maybe that's a lever that we can pull. Uh, When we went into this one market called educational consultants, um, I found a champion, somebody in the market that was really well connected. Mm-hmm. I built a relationship with them. I said, Hey, if you get me five early adopters in this niche, I'll do all of your stuff for free. She started getting us introductions within, um, within three months, we had our champion plus our five early adopters. And we had built out their websites. Um, we gave all of the early adopters a 50% discount on their websites and their ongoing services with the condition that they were going to introduce us to more people. But in mm-hmm. six months, we had over 30 clients in that niche. So, you know, we went from having no authority in a market yeah. to over 30 clients. Well, now, you know, we're speaking at the conference. We've got a trade show booth at the conference. We've got over 30 clients in the market. You know, like within six months, people are coming to us going, hey, you're the experts. You're the go-to company in this niche. Yeah. And, you know, that's great. But like that first company, right? Like we didn't make any, you know, it was an investment for us, almost like a marketing investment. So like, were we working on spec? I don't think so. We were just like, we were getting something different in value than, than somebody paying us. And so I think there are those hacks early on in a market. When we first started doing our coaching work, I had no idea how to coach, whether coaching was something that would have an impact on a business. I grabbed five agency owners that I knew. And for six months, I did a call every week with those agency owners with no form of compensation. Now, Again, I'm not advocating that you go out there and do six months of free work for a bunch of people, but like, you know, I took what I learned with those five people and the results that we got them and we turned that into a multi million dollar coaching business. So, like, you know, we, we figured out the money stuff eventually, but at least that gave me the credibility. I had testimonials, but more importantly, I actually knew what was going to get them results. You know, I knew how to actually work with people in a coaching relationship. If I would have burned those first five clients and just like if they didn't get results, I mean, they didn't pay me anything. So, like, whatever. Right. So I think there's ways to overcome that imposter syndrome and really look at your, those early clients in a market. I call it getting traction in a market. I think it's, it's easy to look at those people as partners in your ability to go in and and, and really gain traction in a market. And then once you have that traction, we can do some really interesting things later. I love that. Minimizing risk helps exponentially to minimize imposter syndrome and make it just a much easier process for you to gain traction. Yeah, for sure. Really like that. That was, uh, that was very well answered. Um, and you also kind of touched on this, this, this champion uh, thing and then getting, you know, having some incentive for them to give you other clients almost like a little growth hack, which kind of led into what my next question was, was which was going to be, you know, what's, some kind of marketing tactic that you'd recommend for someone who's entering a new niche or maybe has a couple of clients, but they're in the very early stage freelancing. 
is looking to get, you know, more qualified leads. Is that something that you would recommend as a good kind of little growth hack for people beginning? Because that did sound, I, I really liked it. I resonated with it. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, you know, there's a free work has like a bad rep in the design world in particular, because I don't know, there's this old, I don't know if you're familiar with that oatmeal uh, cartoon, you know, the, it's, you know, web geeks are into it, but they have a, this person who, you know, their client says, oh, don't worry, we're not going to pay you money. We're going to pay you an exposure, right? And then they take the quote unquote exposure to like the hot dog stand. He's like, oh no, I'm going to pay you an exposure. And the hot dog dude's like, huh. yeah, what the hell are you doing, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so I think there's something to that, right? Because we have clients who come to us and say, oh, I don't need to pay you because I'm going to get your, I'm, I'm such a cool client. I, I'm going to get you exposure, right? And I think that that's created this, idea within the design community and the development community of like people trying to pull the wool over your eyes and say that they're going to pay you through exposure, that working for them is such a privilege that they don't have to pay you. Right. And, and I totally believe in that. Right. But what we're talking about here is, you know, you're going after, let's say the, like, let's say you're a, a click funnels, you know, ninja, and you want to get some big name clients and you have no reputation, you have no network, you have no nothing. Like, if you went and found an A-list client in that market, that having them as your client and also that relationship and, and getting an agreement with them, they would help propel you into the market and right. you approach them, you know, that's a very different relationship. Like, hey, I'm looking to break into this ClickFunnels development market and I need to get a, an A-list client. And you obviously, you know, I, I would also strategically look for that person where maybe they have a network of other people that could be your clients. And then, you know, and maybe there's 10 of those that you could do that with. And one of them actually will take you up on that offer. You know, that can be a great way to gain traction in the market. Another great way is um, we tell a lot of our people to look for market infrastructure. I didn't talk about that as a reason to go after a market, but market infrastructure is blogs, influencers, associations, events, okay. SaaS providers, that kind of stuff. Okay. And, you know, anybody that has like lots of connect, like they have lots of your client. Yes. So when we were going in the restaurant space, uh, Open Table was one of those companies. And I was one of the first web pros to go to Open Table and say, hey, you guys are in a lot of restaurants and mm -hmm. we use your system to link up to our email marketing system in our website. And we like to, you know, we push all of our traffic into your Open Table system. Mm -hmm. Most of your clients' websites are terrible. We can do some things in the websites to increase reservations. Right, right, so right. You should send us leads. And so we would work relationships with our open table reps locally. And they were amazing referral partners, right? And so again, right. I mean, however you can find those kind of multinodal connections in the, in the market, those are great partnership opportunities. If you don't know a market really well, like a lot of times those people will talk to anybody. Wow, I really like that. That's, that's similar to the, the Dream 100 concept of identifying those big influencers and Build a list. relationships with them. Yeah. Beautiful. Absolutely love it. And that's it. So that story that you were talking about when you guys found a, a champion, that, that's actually kind of the thing that gave you guys that initial traction then? Is that something that you guys did with your web design agency? Well, so, I mean, I would say this was like, so, so digital agencies are probably, I tell people it's my 13th niche. So in my book, Get Rich in a Deep End, I walk through the 13, the evolution of the niches that I, that we went after. Okay, and so that, that market was probably like niche number eight. Wow. I love it. You know? And so we had kind of started to learn like, okay, if we're going to be strategic, like how do we identify a market? Yeah. How do we gain traction in that market? How do we build ourselves as an authority in that market? And then if the market is resonating with us and our business, like how do we then scale? And sometimes like we, in that market in particular, the educational consultant market, you know, we got to the scale stage where we were adding a lot of clients in the business, but my team hated working with the niche. Mm. And so, I mean, I had team members that were coming to me and they kind of had an intervention. They're like, we don't really like working with these people. Wow. Um, so if we want to, if, if it's fine, if we keep going this direction, but we're not going to work here. <laughs> and so I did like choose, like, do I take this business and spin it off and, and build a new team? Or do I just, you know, do we continue to like iterate and, and things like that? We chose to keep our team and we spun that business off and sold it to another agency. Wow. That's an interesting uh, second order consequence that, uh, yeah, would be very difficult to forecast happening. 
Well, and, and that's why I say it's fine to like, if you, if you use the analogy of like dating with niches, so it's, you know, this idea that you're going to identify a market and you're going to marry it Mm -hmm. is like kind of just setting a bad expectation. Think about it more as like, Hey, why don't we, you know, go have some fun together then maybe we'll start dating, then we'll have a relationship and then maybe we'll get serious and get engaged. And then maybe one day you'll like marry your niche. Like the niche that I'm in right now, digital agency is like, I'm hundred percent married to this niche. I don't work with any client that is not a digital agency owner or very tightly related to this market in some way. Like I don't, you know, there's just nobody I'm married to the market, right? I don't have an interest in any other market uh, for, for myself as an entrepreneur Uh, But there's a lot of gray area before that. And so sometimes it's like, hey, you know what? Go all in on a market, try it on for six months or a year and, you know, see how it goes. You're going to build a lot of muscles in terms of how you strategically approach a market. Mm -hmm. If it turns out you don't like the market after you've been working it for a year, then you have options. You can sell the business, you can more fit into something else, you know, but I think what a lot of people get stuck on Taylor is they don't actually make the decision. Yeah. They mull over their niche and they're trying to find the perfect niche. It's like going to match.com and like thinking, Oh, I need to find my wife or something or my yeah, husband. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. it's a really bad you know, mindset to think, okay, why don't I just go out and, you know, do, go out on some dates and have some fun. And I think that markets kind of work very similar, right? You're the chance of you finding your forever niche on your first or second go is probably really low. Wow. I love that analogy. This is going to resonate well with people. It's the best way I've ever heard it explained personally. You shouldn't be looking for the one. You should just go dating and just get the ball rolling. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, set the third kind of, we're just moving along the linear path of the different major sectors, the niche, the marketing. And my, my third one was entering sales. Uh, for, for you, what's kind of the sales process that you like to use for us internally? I've, I've spoken about it on YouTube, like we, we use a two-step sales process, a typical discovery call and audit and a sales call. Um, what kind of sales process are you recommending from a high level? So we, ha- we, we have a model, it's called the interaction model. Um, and depending on what you're selling, there actually is a little bit of different recommendation that I, I'll give right. you. So, if you are highly niched and you have a productized offer where you kind of have a one size fits all and or maybe uh, there's two different options or three different options. And, and the important factor here is you're highly niched, meaning all of your clients are like in the same market, whether it's a horizontal or vertical, and you've got 20, 30, 40, 50 clients that all look very similar. Um, in that, if you fit that model, that's it's awesome. a qualification call and a strategy call. And on the strategy call, you're making an offer and you're taking a credit card or payment. Right. If you, if you have a lot of variability in what you end up offering your clients, there's a lot of, it could be a $10,000 project. It could be a $250,000 project. And we actually don't know the answer to that until we go and engage in some kind of discovery process. Right. Um, and, and some of our clients sell half a million dollar million dollar engagements. And so some of those interaction model sequences for them are, um, could be as low as five meetings Mm -hmm. where there's a qualification meeting. There could be two or three discovery meetings, Mm -hmm. proposal Mm -hmm. presentation, a proposal Q and a or solutions presentation. So there's, there's some steps depending on how big of work you're, you're selling and how complicated it is. Right. Um, if you're selling projects that are, uh, you know, the client, one of our clients that sold recently a half a million dollar engagements, I think he had 23, uh, interactions with the client before they signed the proposal. There's probably seven or eight different stakeholders that were yeah. involved in that process. And so depending on that approach, if you're uh, not a productized niche focused agency, then we, you know, the interaction model is a little bit bigger. If you're a productized niche focus agency, then sometimes some of our clients like to even get rid of the qualification call and they have one call. Um, yeah. But most of them are uh, what I'd call kind of a, they're kind of kings of their domain. Like they are the They're very well known in their niche. They're doing a ton of marketing. They're advertising on Facebook. They're on webinars and they're doing a lot of marketing. So they already have a lot of touches with their clients before they show up. Um, If that's not the case, if you have no market authority, then your sales process has to do a little bit of that work, right? If somebody has no idea who you are, they don't know what they need. You don't know what they need, right? 
then we need to have a different sales process. Would you agree like the colder the sales, the colder the lead and the larger the potential cost, the longer the sales process and vice versa, in, inverse? Yeah. So if yeah. you don't have like, you know, whenever we see somebody who has a highly productized offer and they're highly niched and there's no trust when the clients show up, you know, the sales process should be one or two steps. But that usually means, hey, we have a marketing problem. We have an awareness problem. Like we're not, we're not generating enough leads. We're not nurturing enough, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but if you have something where you don't have your generalist agency, you get clients from all over the, you know, every industry, you have no reputation in a market, you have no like proven results page about that market specific problems, right? I mean, that's where your sales process has to build a lot of the trust and credibility. And so, you know, if you're selling a hundred thousand dollar project, I would estimate you'd probably need 10 interactions. That's a rule of thumb, an interaction in your sales process for every $10,000 of value. And then there's obviously kind of a little bit of a, there's a, a little bit of a, a slope where that starts to kind of not necessarily hold water, but up right. to like 200, $300,000 deals, you're going to probably have somewhere between 10 and 20 interactions in your sales process to sell to that level, just because of the complexity, yeah. the trust, the risk, like, and, and again, if you're, if you're signing on the dotted line for 200 K project, there's a lot of risk for you. Like what yeah. happens if it should have been $350,000, right? Like, I mean, I've had that go down within our agency where we miss scope something and it costs us a lot of money, you know? And so I think you don't want to rush sales if that's the case where there's a lot of risk on the line. That's so beautiful. And the, uh, the mental model of touch point for 10,000, of course it peters off at some point, but that's, that's really cool. Where did you come up with that here for that? Where did you learn that? Uh, I had over a thousand proposals in my website proposal folder. Uh, I mean, I think I hired half dozen sales coaches and mentors, but I mean, a thousand pitches, lots of coaching. And we developed that model and we've now taught that to, you know, I mean, 10,000 plus web pros in this market. So um, we've had some time to refine that and, uh, and, and poke the holes in it, right? Because we had people coming in, you know, my interaction model, which was five or six steps. Mm -hmm. you know, and we were selling high five figure projects. And then somebody would come in and run that same process for a $3,000 website. And it was like, okay, like, well, that doesn't need to happen, right? Or they'd run my process and they'd go sell a $200,000 project and they'd be like, you know, they end up getting messed up because they, yeah. you know, promise something that maybe they should have done more due diligence on. Right. So we've, we've put a lot of work into that. It's called the interaction model. We put a lot of work into that. Um, and, and there's some nuance to it. Right. I think if we had, we were only working with Facebook ad agencies that only sold to right. consultants, um, you know, we probably could say, Hey, here's the, you know, here's the thing, here's how the sales process works. Here's what your ads look like. Right. And, but I think we're, we, we kind of coach a little bit more in, in the nuance um, where not all of our agencies are the exact same. Yeah. Which is, which I like definitely um, almost like the yeah higher level mental models, but still, still drills down into different areas. Um, I want to touch on operations really going through the sectors here. When it comes to operations, how do you think of, productizing the service? And I know that's such a vague general question. It's almost just embarrassing to ask it, but maybe some high level mental models that come to your mind when you think about productizing the service or just what comes to your mind when you think about how to do that. Yeah. I mean, I think if you have, if, if you're trying to scale, the things that we want in operations are having a playbook, having the ability to have SOPs, mm -hmm. having repeatable processes that the agency owner doesn't necessarily have to be involved in. Right. If your business is, if every client is a different and unique snowflake, right. it's really hard to create those operational systems. And so do we have to productize in order to scale? I mean, not necessarily, but we need to have some kind of... Um, lowest common denominator. So whether that's the type of client, like it's a very specific vertical, 
Mm -hmm. there's a little bit of a constraint in the type of work we do, mm -hmm. uh, or it's a, it's a horizontal and there's a lot of constraint around the type of work we do, right? Like, let's say for instance, you're a, a, a Shopify expert, right? Well, do you build the Shopify stores? Are you doing CRO in the Shopify stores? Are you doing ads in the Shopify stores, right? Shopify cuts across a lot of industries and that's okay, but you're going to have to get really clear on what you do and what you don't do. Mm. Uh, I had this really bad habit early on of every time a client would ask me if we could do something, I would answer with yes. Yeah. And then I'd have to go to my team and I'd have to teach them about what we were trying to get them, you know, what we were trying to deliver for this client, you know, to right. the point where we were stepping outside of our zone of genius all the time. And it was frustrating my team and, and they couldn't, you know, they'd build a process for building a website. And then two weeks later, I'd be like, hey, guess what? We just promised this new kind of website, right? Or this new content management system or this new thing, right? And so you have to start creating those constraints, I think, if you're going to create operational scale ability. Productization is one way to do that, right? It's a constraint. It's basically saying, look, we're not going to sell everything. We're going to sell this one thing inside this box. It's going to be called this. It's going to have these five features and benefits. It's going to cost this much. Um, here's how it's onboarded. Here's how it's delivered. Here's how it's you know, launched, here's how it's scaled and optimized. Here's how we manage the client relationship, right? Every time you make a change right. and you add one thing, like there's a, there's this domino impact, right? All the way down to like, what the heck do we put on the invoice? Yes. And so like productization can be a beautiful way to scale. Some of the coolest agencies that I've met over the last 10, you know, 15 years have had highly productized offerings. Um, it's not the only way to get to a multiple seven figure or eight figure agency, mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely one way to create, I think, more freedom in your business because when it's productized, it's a constraint. And so then you can say, hey, here's the SOP for delivering this thing. And then what happens is, is eventually you realize that you're no longer needed in the fulfillment process because your team sees, you know, they understand the SOP, they can run the SOP, like they might be better at it than you are, you know, they have more time available, like they can provide a better level of service, your client gets better results. Yeah. Um, so that can be a good thing. I think it's kind of a blind spot for me coming from uh, pretty much that exact demo, like audience that you were kind of describing where a uh, hyper targeted niche, all clients look the same, the work is literally the exact same, we're in this pretty specific box. And so for us, the only model that makes sense is productization. And with, 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 you know, tight constraints, but um, when it comes to scaling the unique snowflake model, what like, like are the constraints and the systems that are put in place operationally speaking, just higher level and it becomes more important to kind of just lean on the people because it's more creative work. Like, like what, you know what I mean? How does that, yeah. Operate. I mean, what would the word that came to mind for me when you started talking about that was basically you move from the the value in the agency being the SOPs and the intellectual property that you've built up and accrued in that niche yeah. to your talent yes. and talent becomes everything. Mm -hmm. So you have to have people that have uh, a very broad, you know, sometimes broad skill set and narrow skill set. You have to have specialists that can come in and understand complex problems. Mm -hmm. And so then you can create a business model constraint, let's say around billable hours, like a really easy way. So like one of the companies that uh, a, a mentor of mine who ran Effective UI, I mean, they were a couple hundred person uh, agency okay. doing, you know, well into the eight figures, right? right? Like massive business. And their constraint was the billable hour of really, really smart people. Wow. Cool. You know, so they'd go into companies like Boeing and Boeing would be like, hey, we have UI problems with our, you know, how our airplane repair logistics works, right? We have all these planes in the air. They've got these billion dollar problems, right? So, you know, they bring in effective UI and say, hey, we have all of these UIs from the ticketing agents, the you know, the air traffic people, the luggage people, like everybody's got these various UIs, whether it's a lever on a wall. I mean, there's UIs everywhere. Right. And we know some of these UIs are costing us potentially millions or tens of millions of dollars. Like we need you to come in and solve this problem for us, right? So in a model like that, you create scale by having really, really talented people. And you go in and say, what's this worth to you, right? Oh, hey, here's $10 million. Cool. $200 an hour, right? Like, great. We just sold this huge, 
you know, now we have these really talented people and they're going to go in and do things that talented people do. Right. Like, so in their, in their space, like the constraint is the billable hour and you know, their, their scale comes from going and finding really big companies that don't want to build a UI UX team. Mm -hmm. They want, they don't, Boeing doesn't want to go out there and have HR go build a team from scratch. They want to go to Boeing or they want to go to effective UI and say, Hey, we need 30 people for the next six months to work on this. And, you know, effective UI figures that out and they assign those resources to that thing. So, you know, in those types of models, you create scale through talent. And that's kind of what I would call like, I don't know. I personally think it's the old agency model. It's been around, you know, right. the Mad Men era and, you right. know, as, as early as agencies have been around, that model has been around. I think the productized, like what you guys are doing is more of the new model where you're highly specialized to a market you have a very, you know, a great thing that you're able to do that gets a very specific result. And, you know, that's also a way to scale. And usually that creates a lot more, from what I've seen, like profit for ownership. Right. And most of the agencies that I've seen that scale have scale productized better. It seems like the people that are doing it have less gray hair and are less stressed out. I don't know. This is anecdotal the best, right? But like, you know, I've met, a, I've met a lot of guys that run, you know, high seven figure, eight figure agencies that like, don't really like what they do because, you know, it's very broad. It's, it's just hard to, it's hard to scale that. Yeah. It just, the whole thing just makes me nervous thinking about it. Like the <laughs> awesome complexity and secondary consequences that are not foreseeable. I, I don't know. I, I like the productized box that runs the same and it's just more predictable but i do have so much respect for scaling that chaos of leaning on talent and then just having such a high level constraint like billable hours that that's like that's really cool and i think it's probably harder to scale by like just... something that i like to see agencies do in this productized model and, and speaking of operations so um it is abstracting what's not core to their business kind of out of their, out of their business, uh, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So, so like, you know, whether that's like, let's say part of your productized service is building websites and, you know, but it's not really core. Like, let's say you work with, you know, IT professionals and you help them get leads. And a key part of that is websites, but really your offering is lead gen for this very specific market. Right. 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 And so, you know, does it make sense for a company like that to have like a team of full-time web designers that are building websites? Like that's not really their core work product. Right. Their core work product is account managers that can spin all the plates around websites, Facebook ads, Google ads, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, part of that's building a website, right? So if you can find ways to abstract some of those services and then have another company that can build as many websites as you want kind of on right. the back end, then I think that can create a lot of powerful scale opportunities. In our early days of our agency, you know, every time we needed to do something, we hired a full-time person for it. You know, so we had web designers, content people, developers, right? All kind of working under one hood. And that's a very diverse set of skill sets, diverse personalities. You know, some people were cheap, some people were really expensive, right? Um, you know, whether it was, we were trying to maintain our own hosting infrastructure. I mean, and trust me, we got ourselves way over our heads. Like we would have all our websites on a, on a server in some basement somewhere and, you know, hard drive would fail. And we had like a dude in the office that kind of did server stuff. And then, you know, we had 50 <laughs> websites that go down and we'd be like, Eric, dude, all these websites went down. And he's like, Hey, I'm on vacation. And we're like, Oh wow, we're screwed. Right. Um, and so like this idea of being able to abstract, you know, yeah. your, some, some of that stuff out of your business, I think can create a lot of, freedom. And it's difficult to do that when you're not specialized, when you're not niched. Yes. That was, that was such a great segment. I could cut that out and make that a separate video. <laughs> Publish it everywhere. That segment on operations. Uh, love it. HR. We're transitioning. Well, by the way, do we have a time limit? I, I have an hour on our calendar. I, I don't know if you have 11 minutes left. Is that okay? I'm good for, yeah, I'm good for 11. Okay. HR. How do you attract the greatest talent? How do you attract the greatest talent? Um, so I'm a big fan of right person, right seat. Mm -hmm. 
And so it's, it's not about attracting just like the best and brightest people because Mm -hmm. I, I did that for a while. And I can tell you that the best and brightest people in general, right. Are expensive. Yes. Um, and they don't always want to do the job that maybe you hired them for. Maybe they're like, oh, I'm the best and brightest. I'll go do this job for you for a little bit, but eventually you're going to promote me into doing something else like much more interesting, right? Which is, is you know, A players, type A individuals who like to, you know, get promoted and grow. You know, that's, that's awesome, right? Except for the fact when you have a job that actually does need to get done, you know, 12 months out of the year and, you know, you don't want to be continuously hiring for it, right? So we had this really bad habit early on of, you know, hiring people that really wanted to be like, you know, um, account managers or, you know, strategic directors or creative directors, right? But we need to like web designer. We need somebody who was like cool with just like being a web designer for like the next three to four years. Yeah. And because otherwise you hire somebody that really wants to be a creative director, they're sitting in the web designer seat for six months and your creative director is still there. Yeah. And they're not going anywhere. Right. And then like six months goes, you know, and then people get like unhappy. Right. So, you know, so right person, right seat. Um, so I think that's really key. And I think that we, to attract the best people, you just, you just need to do a lot of work to define your seats extraordinarily well and just be really clear about what those key accountabilities are, what you expect out of that person and hire people that really want to do that thing. Yeah. Um, and if you hear people in an interview, like I was interviewing a salesperson um, like a year or so ago, and I was like, you know, tell me where you want to be. And they're like, well, yeah, I really like, I really want to be in like business management. And I think I'm going to do like sales for a little while. And like, you know, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe a year just kind of do sales and kind of like, you know, learn that. But eventually I want to go do this other stuff. It's yeah. like, you know, and I'm, I think they're telling me that because they want me to be like impressed and, you know, excited know. and, yeah. you know, and, and I think there's, I like to have people that have a growth mindset, but I think you also want to hire people that really want the job yeah. that you're hiring for. And so I look for that a lot. I mean, I think so defining your seat really well and, you know, treating your job application like it's a marketing funnel. You yeah. know, I, I, I get people all the time. They're like, Oh, where, where should I post my job at? And I'm in my answer is everywhere. Like, I don't know, you know, like is indeed better than Craigslist. I don't know. I post in, I post on indeed. I post on LinkedIn. I post on the Denver egotist, Andrew Hudson's job board. Um, I pay for traffic on Facebook. I give strategic partners of mine money to boost their ads. I have an email list of people that I send to whenever we're hiring. Yeah. I send an email to our entire list of 65,000 agency owners. I mean, we promote everywhere we can. And, you know, I'm looking for that next rock star for our team. So, you know, I think getting that job posting great, getting, you know, your, your job posting itself promoted like crazy, Mm -hmm. and then having a hiring process that, you know, finds, finds the, uh, the golden egg in that pile, I guess, right. Having some vetting process. And at the end of the day, like people are gonna, you know, you got to pay them what, a market rate for their job. Yes. Um, for a while I'd do weird things like, Oh, you're going to be on probation for the first three months. So we're going to pay you a less amount of money. And like, I'm like, man, who wants to be on probation? Like, I don't know. Like I have like, I've never actually been in like legal probation, but I imagine it like from school, it just sounds bad. Right. Yeah. And so I think there's stuff like that that agencies do. Like they have intern programs. They have people start on probation. They give people reduced salaries for the first three months. And, you know, I don't think that's an environment that actually attracts A players. I think A players want to be treated like A players on day one. So we actually go all in. People get full salary, full benefits, full vacation. If you like start on, if you start today and you tell me immediately that you need a vacation and you're an A player and I like, you need to have a recharge or reset, like A players can figure that out. Yeah. You know, if they need that vacation and they're truly an A player, like, okay. You know, but if they're like, oh man, I just got hired and I'm going to use my 10 days of vacation on my first week. Right. Like, I mean, if they're, if they're not an A player, like that's going to come out pretty quick. Right. So we, we try to treat people like they're A players from day one, um, celebrate them making a huge choice for their, their life and their business. And I think that mentality has helped us keep people. I mean, I'm not going to say we have forever employees, but like five to eight years has been kind of average tenure for my companies. And, you know, from what I've heard from other entrepreneurs, that seems like on the higher end. Right. I mean, the medium tenor seems to be like 1.8. 
So I feel like I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, you guys are doing great. <laughs> Um, and I see that cause I go through all these competitors in our space with, with our recruiting process and just like dozens and dozens of our competitors on LinkedIn, medium tenors right there in the analytics of the company. Mm. So. Yeah. Well, in, you know, I mean, compensation is important, but yeah. I think the real reason that a players like to do a player work is they want they want probably more intrinsic reward from a job. Like they want to be challenged. They want to be pushed. Right. They want to, they want autonomy in their position. Right. They don't want to be micromanaged. Right. They want to like believe in what the company is doing. But if you don't, you know, if you haven't, if you're not paying people like what they should be paying at a market rate, then, you know, it's hard to create that meaning because every day they come to work, they're like questioning whether you value them. Mm. Yes. I love how uh, I just threw this, general HR question at you and you broke it down with really good context. Like, Hey, okay, well, a player is great, but you know, right seat, right person. You want, don't want to always hire people that want to go up to be a director. Sometimes you try to find people that really want to do that one thing. And I really like that, that you broke it out beautifully like that. Um, sure. Well, there's only four minutes, random question. Then maybe I'll throw one more at you uh, on your t-shirt. Cloudways. What is that? Yeah, so I'm a Cloudways Maverick. Thanks for asking. Um, I work with a couple of, of different types of companies in the WordPress space in particular, but they're a, a cloud hosting solution, not just for WordPress, but basically if you're, a, if you're an agency or a business that has a website or lots of websites uh -huh. um, and you want to host on a cloud infrastructure like Amazon, mm -hmm. and if anybody out there knows what it's like to go in and set up AWS servers, it can be kind of freaky. And so Cloudways basically is a management layer on top of that that makes it dead simple. Like I set up our host, our, our website on Cloudways and I am not a sysadmin. I am not a developer. Um, I am not a web hosting expert. And so we're able to leverage the Amazon infrastructure using Cloudways. So I'm one of their mavericks and we just go out and kind of say, uh, you know, build value with other agencies out there in the marketplace. And they've created a really cool platform for us to, to do that. So we host a bunch of trainings, workshops, that kind of stuff for agencies that are interested. Beautiful. Love it. Um, final cue, where can people find you, man? Yeah. So if they're interested in more information about me, uh, in particular, uh, ugurus.com, that's U-G-U-R-U-S.com. Uh, if you are an agency out there um, and you are thinking about niching or you have questions about our sales process. Um, we've got a couple of free courses on just that. So if you want to shoot me an email, brent at ugurus.com, happy to hook you up with that. Uh, love your audience and your platform. So anything we can do for your people, we're happy to help. This was such a legendary interview. Uh, I feel like I walked away with a lot, which is just amazing. So selfishly, I'm very pleased. <laughs> and I hope everyone else is, is, is pleased as well. Th thank you so much for coming on, brother. I'd love to have you on again at some point in the future. Awesome. Thanks, Taylor. All right. Much love. All right, ladies and gents, hopefully you enjoyed that interview with Brent. I walked away with a lot personally, which was absolutely amazing. That's why we do these interviews. And I hope you walked away with a lot as well. There's only one thing I ask of you. You know what that is. It's to hit the subscribe button. If you enjoy this interview and you want me to do more interviews for this channel, please let me know. And also, if there's anybody specific that you'd like me to interview, please, uh, by all means, let me know in the comment section below so I can reach out to this person. Brent was someone who I believe someone commented on in, 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 on a live stream and said, hey, what have you heard of Brent Weaver? And I was like, no, I, I, I haven't. And I think, I think that's how we got in touch. Um, no, actually, it was a referral of someone who was watching a subscriber. And anyways, long story short, hit the subscribe button. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section of people you want me to interview. Hit the like button if you enjoyed this. Hit the dislike button if you thought it was terrible. Thank you so much, you guys. All right, much love. Ciao.